Let me just briefly ask the organizers whether we should get started. Since we started a bit late with the break, should we wait longer? Or should I, we... Michael, you can start. I can start. Okay. Yes, thank Very you. Very good. Uh, Professor Palos, you're there? Yes, I see you. Hello. Dr. Sulu, are you there as well? I saw you earlier. Hello. Let us get started. I am, firstly, a warm welcome to the session of the Berlin Demography Days on Family and Fertility. I am Michael Herman, advisor on economics and demography with UNFPA, United Nations Population Fund. The Population Fund is a proud partner of Population Europe and the Berlin Demography Days. In this session, we have two presentations. The first one will be given by Professor Esteve Palos. He's the director of the Center for Demography at Barcelona's Autonomous University. And before I give you the floor, Professor Palos, let me just remind all the participants to post your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. I will also monitor the chat function. And I understand that if you have a question or want to participate in the conversation after the presentations, for which we hopefully have a bit of time, you can also raise your hand in the participants list. The presentation by Professor Palos is entitled Family Dynamics in Latin America, the Measurement Challenge. Family Dynamics in Latin America, the Measurement Challenge. Professor Palos, the floor is yours. So thank you. Uh, I guess I can share the screen. No? Is it okay? Let me let me do it. Um, okay, all good. All good. All let's good. let's see now. I need to share the PowerPoint. Okay, do you see the PowerPoint now? Perfect. Okay, so do I have uh, like twenty minutes? That would be great. Okay, so um, yeah, thank you uh, very much, uh, Michelle, for sharing this session, and also Andreas for inviting me to uh, give a presentation on which are the measurement challenges in uh, Latin America regarding family dynamics um, in this continent. I'm uh, maybe some of you don't know, but I have written several articles on the kind of patterns and trends of different family dimensions in Latin America. And I guess Andreas thought that I could be uh, a good uh, person to make like a general overview whether we have the right data in the region or not. Um, so by family uh, dynamics, uh, I, I meant uh, the study of uh, the causes and trends, patterns, and implications of several, of several uh, dimensions of family change, uh, including union formation, when we do we marry, whether we use marriage or cohabitation, including uh, fertility, the transition to first, second, third uh, birth, including union dissolution. Uh, it's basically whether we stay a lot of time with our partners or we, there's a lot of divorce, separation, widowhood, also, what happens after we break our unions and whether we uh, repartner again, remarry, etc. And then how we organize our households. It's basically the living arrangements. Uh, if we live with our parents, if we live in extended households, in nuclear households, and how our, our organ, uh, households are organized. So all these, these issues, all these concepts belong to the the this uh, <clears throat> group or subfield of research uh, called uh, family demography and family dynamics. Uh, before addressing the, the specific issues of data, I'd like to highlight some characteristics of uh, Latin American family dynamics, because to understand what kind of data we need to measure how families work in Latin America. And uh, I'd like to highlight uh, like, uh, for uh, unique, I would say, features of Latin American families. 
probably the most exceptional one that makes uh, not nowadays, but in the past, uh, Latin American unique. It's the historical presence of unmarried cohabitation. Um, in this graph, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you uh, the percentage of women uh, in union who were in cohabitation in different censuses in Mexico. And I do classify these women depending on the state uh, where they were living. Um, probably uh, you won't believe, but in the Mexican census of 1930, there was already a question on cohabitation. And I guess this is the first time ever that the census, even before the Scandinavians uh, measured cohabitation, that a, a, a cohabitation question is, uh, was included in a census uh, question. And as we can see that in some states of Mexico by 1930, there were more than 60, 70 percent of women in union who were already cohabiting in 1930. And then we see like a decline over the century, uh, reaching the like the lowest point around 1980. And then what we see after 1980 is this uh, boom of cohabitation, not only in Mexico, but also all over uh, Latin America. So this is a very important to have in mind that we have uh, uh, historically very high rates of cohabitation. Okay. The second unique feature of Latin America would be that even educational expansion has taken place, even now that we have more women working in the labor force, still the transition to first birth, the transition to first union, happens at a relatively early age and it has not changed over time. So the average age at first child, the average age at first union has not increased over the last four or five uh, decades. And this is again, is a graph that includes several countries in Latin America using data from the demographic health service where I basically plot here the proportion of women who have experienced first intercourse, first union or first child by age 18. And I classify these women based on their birth cohorts. And as you can see, this very flat pattern indicates that nothing has changed and that uh, basically uh, the average age at first union and the average age of first child has remained stable. So we have very stable calendars, but increasing level of cohabiting uh, unions. Uh, these are very unique combinations of two features that in other regions of the world, they don't happen like this. Well, we have seen in Europe is an increasing cohabitation and also postponement of age of union formation. Like a third uh, <clears throat> feature, it's because of cohabitation, uh, Latin American unions are very, have, have a very high chance to break up. So there's a very high incidence of union dissolution. So many of these women who cohabit and they have children at a very young age, they end up breaking up their unions, which means that that increases the number of households where there is only uh, women uh, taking care of children. So there's a lot of single mothers. And also it uh, represents a, lo a lots of households that are headed by, by women. So the female headship is also uh, comparatively higher than in other regions of the world. And in this graph, I'm showing how the probability of union dissolution has changed over time for different cohorts of women in Colombia. And as you can see, this is the duration of months. So after 60 months, like five years, like 30% of uh, most recent cohabiting unions have already uh, been uh, dissolved and also when it reaches after 10 years is all half of them. 
But what is interesting is that cohabiting couples are more likely to break than uh, married couples. These green colors are the cohabiting couples and the bluish colors are the married couples. And also what we see is that the most recent cohabiting couples are also more likely to dissolve to break than uh, the, the oldest cohabiting couple. So uh, lots of cohabitation, uh, uh, early transitions to first child, this is, uh, these high levels of union dissolution, they, 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 they have a consequence on the number of single mothers that we have and also the number of children that are only raised by their mothers, okay? And the last feature I would like to highlight is that because of all these transitions, because of people marry at have unions at very young ages, because of these high levels of union dissolutions, families play a very strong role supporting all these transitions. No? And this is only an example uh, where I'm using uh, Mexican data from the uh, retrospective survey, Encuesta Demográfica Retrospectiva in Mexico, where we can see that almost 40% of women born in 1965-1969, they were living with their parents or with their parents-in-law at the time they entered their first union. So it's very common to start living with your partner, to start cohabitation, or to start uh, marriage within the context of your family. And as we can see that for recent course, it's even higher. So uh, it's even above 40%. Uh, and what we know also is that 70% of the single mothers are living with their parents or are living in extended households. So families really play a very important role in protecting uh, men and women from these difficult family transitions that sometimes they come with a lot of vulnerability and a lot of, uh, uh, so they need extra support to, 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 to the family really play a role in, 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 in making sure that, 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 that these, these single mothers are not left alone and they have some resources and there's some sharing resources. Okay, so uh, given these uh, unique features of Latin America, what kind of data we need you know, and what uh, kind of data we can use. And basically here, uh, we can rely, I'm a classical uh, family demographer, so unfortunately I don't still, uh, I don't use big data or other kind of data. And I basically try to rely on the classical demographical data sources, which are mainly three. I would say data that comes from registers, then data that comes from population censuses, and then data that comes uh, from surveys. And these surveys can either be cross-sectional or uh, longitudinal. I'm not going to talk about registered data because uh, having good registered data requires requires a lot of, uh, like I would say, decades of modernization and and change because collecting uh, uh, data uh, from individuals through registers. Uh, really requires an implementation of local offices, civil servants, so it's still Latin America, the quality of the registered data is, is not very good. And many of the interesting events that family demographers like to study are not registered at all. So uh, uh, I think we can, this is, a, we can, uh, we cannot talk or we cannot rely on this data to study uh, family dynamics. But we can rely on population censuses, and then we can also rely on surveys. So now I, I'm going to talk a little bit about these uh, two different types of data. So let's go uh, to population censuses. So here I like to say that that uh, given the specificity of Latin American family dynamics and also the historical presence of cohabitation in Latin America. Uh, I guess since 1960s, almost all censuses in the region capture unmarried cohabitation. And I have shown you that uh, in 1930, the Mexican census had also a question on unmarried uh, cohabitation. So this is an advantage. So, 
So we can really uh, trace, we can document, we can explore the historical origins and the historical uh, distribution of unmarried uh, cohabitation through censuses in the region. And the advantage of censuses are that uh, they basically include all populations, so the, the coverage is universal, and sometimes we have access to 100% of microdata. And when you have access to 100% of microdata from censuses, you can build maps like these. This is a map that took like two years of work. Uh, this is the map of cohabitation in the medics based on census microdata from the 2000s. And the red colors indicate that there is more cohabitation than marriage, and the blue colors indicate that there's more marriage than cohabitation. And as you can see in Brazil, the amount of detail that we have, it's impressive. Compared to Canada, where we have a very a big, big regions because the census, uh, the availability or the access to this geographic uh, data, it's, it's, it's lower compared to Latin America. But look in Mexico, we have almost, I think, uh, I remember more than, than 3,000 or uh, re different local areas where we can have these very detailed maps of cohabitation in, in Latin America. This is the picture from 2000, and this is the increase of cohabitation over just a 10 period of time. You see that now almost all Latin America is red, which means that cohabitation is prevailing. It's more common than marriage in almost all regions of Latin America. And as you can see, we have a lot of, a lot of detail. I can make a zoom to uh, um, uh, the Indian countries. So Venezuela, Colombia, uh, Peru and Bolivia. And you see these light areas here, which, are, which means that there's less cohabitation than marriage. And then the darkest areas is there's more cohabitation than marriage. And, 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 and I'm always impressed that um, the, 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 the reason why I'm showing this maps to you is that I guess there is no other region in the world. There is no other continent in the world where you can have maps like this. And, and, and so regarding access to censuses and the coverage of censuses in Latin America, I think we are, oh, this is the best region in the world. So it's not a challenge here. It's a challenge for other regions of the world, but not for Latin America. And the reason is, it's that because together with IPUMS International, as you know, this is a big database where you can have access to many census microdata samples from all over the world, but also thanks to CELADE, which is the United Nations Demographic Center in Santiago de Chile, you can have access to 100% density. So all people who were ever recorded in the census in Latin America, in Celade, they have the data. And then you can build these beautiful maps going uh, to Celade, asking them permission and getting the data. And as you can see, this, uh, the data we use comes from Celade and this is the number of units, like for some countries we have, like Brazil, more than 5,000 uh, units. And this is for Latin America, and we have the same also from uh, for the Caribbean countries. So very complete coverage of census microdata in the regions, nothing compared to any other region in the world. And the reason it's because for decades, uh, Latin American uh, statistical offices have sent systematically, every time they were doing a census, they sent the census tapes to the headquarters of Celade in Santiago de Chile. And they not only have the census tape, as you can see in these pictures, but they also have the documentation, the metadata. And because of that, this is the best region in the world where we can have this uh, kind of analysis. Okay, so not bad regarding census, and I guess better than average regarding census. When it comes to surveys, then this is more uh, problematic. Um, there is 
there are household surveys available for all the regions as there are uh, with censuses. I know that Celare also has this collection of household surveys, but still we don't have access to them. IPUMS is trying to get access to the household surveys and probably this could be an alternative to census in the future. But now I will focus on surveys. And first of all, I would like to talk about cross-national surveys. Um, if we want to do something more than describing trends, if we want to start studying a little bit the sequence and combine different dimensions of family change, I guess the best tool, available tool that we have is the demographic health service in Latin America. And as you can see, uh, in the 1980s and the 1990s, 1990s, they were so popular that at least we have eight, six, seven countries with uh, with uh, demographic surveys, but uh, a, a trend is going on where we have over time less and less uh, uh, house uh, countries uh, running um, demographic surveys. The reason probably it's because the, the reason why this demographic health service were uh, created in first place was to control fertility. And now that fertility is going down in many of these countries, probably there's less and less interest and also less and less resources to study, to continue studying the drivers of fertility. But unfortunately, those who are studying uh, uh, family demography uh, are missing also the, the possibility of studying union formation, studying transition to first child, also to, to the first sex, and all these uh, related things that are not necessarily uh, fertility. The exception is perhaps the new, uh, the new Colombia 2015 uh, DHS, um, Colombia is keeping a good track of uh, collecting DHS data every five, seven uh, years. And, 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 and the last uh, 2015 uh, DHS for Colombia, it was the first to include union histories. You know? So um, I hope that the, the experience of Colombia is now uh, generalized or spread to other countries of the region because this would be an excellent, like good news for family demographers. We, we could go beyond the classical study of fertility and study union dissolution, remarriage, repartnering, all these dimensions that are unique in uh, Latin America. If we don't have uh, DHS, the, the other alternative, and I would, I would really, I'm a big fan of the retrospective approach in Latin America. I think it's um, the Mexican uh, retros uh, retrospective uh, surveys are a good example of I would, uh, what would be my recommendation that we meet more uh, surveys like the Mexican one, where you can have complete histories on several dimensions. You have labor, migration, uh, union formation, childbearing, educational attainment, and then you can really build uh, not only documenting patterns, but understand the consequences and causes of all these changes. What it's what we really need. Um, unfortunately, it's only Mexico, Brazil, uh, I think Uruguay, we also have some, uh, some surveys, but for the other countries in Latin America, it's not an option. I would not recommend in Latin America to have panel like uh, approach because of uh, attrition is high in Sweden. I cannot expect how, how high it could be in Latin American countries living with high mobility and constant change of unions and repartnering and children with different partners and so on. That might be even more complicated. So just to summarize, um, so we, uh, uh, we, we have seen that if we want to study family dynamics in Latin America, we have several options. If we want to document trends uh, and explore patterns, we can rely on censuses. They offer a good perspective and also a lot of regional detail. No other source has a similar regional detail. The problem of the challenge is the future of the census are in danger, is in danger mainly because many countries probably are not, not keeping this 10 year uh, period. Uh, uh, like that they do it every 10 years and some countries might abandon the idea of doing classical surveys. 
As an alternative, you could use household service. I know that they exist. I know that they are very coherent. So you could do like this national analysis based on household service. The problem is that yet uh, we don't have access to harmonized access to these surveys. And uh, hopefully IPUMS uh, can contribute to that in the future. Then the other alternative is demographic field surveys. The problem with that is that they are not available in all countries. They were mainly focusing targeting those countries that had higher fertility levels. We don't have demographic field surveys in Argentina. We don't have uh, demographic field surveys in, in Chile or in Uruguay. And as you have seen now, there are less and less countries that they are uh, doing demographic field surveys. And perhaps the big hope is a, uh, trying to generalize, trying to have more retrospective surveys like the ones they have in Mexico in other countries of the region. So that would be the, the final slide and my final comment. So like, thank you very much for uh, your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Pallas, for, for this presentation. And I'm really looking forward to debating with you all these interesting findings, not just the data sources. Yeah? And Anne Gauthier in the Q&A function just mentioned that uh, Uruguay will be rolling out a GGS, a gender and generation survey. I know you were quite skeptical just now about panel kind of uh, surveys, but uh, mm -hmm. I think if that's successful, I think it should help us understand quite a bit more about what's going on here in Latin America. And I'm really looking forward to this, but um, let's not have a conversation now. Let's have the other presentation and then come back into the group for discussions. Our next presenter is, I'm happy to introduce him. I haven't seen him personally for a while, but we have collaborated closely in various, at various occasions is Dr. Elias Sulu. He is the executive director and founder of AFIDEP, the African Institute for uh, Populate, uh, Development Policy. And his presentation is entitled The Social and Economic Impact of Fertility Change. The Social and Economic Impact of Fertility Change by Professor Dr. Elias Sulu. You have the floor. All right, uh, thank you very much uh, for that intro. Can you hear me and can you see my slide? We can hear you well and we can see the slide well. All right, thank you. And uh, I'm really very, very happy to be part of the, uh, part of the meeting here. Um, I know it's tough times and just I uh, want to congratulate uh, the Berlin uh, Demography Group for uh, still organizing this under these uh, tough COVID circumstances. But I just want to share some thoughts on uh, the social and economic impact of fertility change. Uh, I'm going to focus mainly on um, how this issue of fertility change is, uh, is, uh, is looked at in Africa and, um, and uh, what are some of the general impacts. But more critically, I'll focus on uh, the um, the, the demographic dividend issue, how it has changed the mindset of people in looking at uh, the role of a fertility decline in development, but also what is happening on the continent as a result of this and highlight some areas where I feel like, you know, the scientific and uh, the international development community can, can come in to support uh, the, uh, the continent uh, more effectively on, uh, on moving forward with this agenda. So, um, Oh, am I, okay, I'm trying to, okay. Uh, so uh, as, as an intro here, I just want to highlight, I think a lot of the things that maybe a lot of us sitting in this meeting understand already, but really just to highlight that uh, fertility change is, uh, is probably the most, the most critical um, uh, driver of population dynamics and, uh, and has serious uh, implications on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on well-being. We know that uh, this uh, change uh, in population dynamics is often a, a balance between uh, uh, birth rates and death rates, uh, but to the extent that decline in birth rates is a, is a, is a, is a desired uh, sort of outcome for almost everybody, it's not contentious programs meant to address this issue uh, are, are, not, are not often challenged and uh, the, 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 the debates are about which ones can accelerate this 
this change. But uh, when it comes to fertility, which has behavioral aspects and so on, uh, it's a link to, it, it drives population dynamics are very, very significantly. But also, you know, the future of population change would depend for the most part on what happens to fertility. And uh, it's still a contentious issue uh, for both uh, those with high fertility, but also in, uh, in, uh, in countries with, uh, with low fertility. So you look at the whole issue of um, a, a fertility, high fertility, especially being the primary driver of population growth, um, the dependency ratio now looking at the age structure, um, uh, uh, who, who is um, uh, where we have most people in the, in the age distribution, the issue of aging, which is the ultimate sort of uh, 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 impact of these long-term declines in fertility. And we've seen how in some Asian countries where within a generation birth rates have come down from like four or five to two or even, you know, 1.5, that the, the process of our population aging has, 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 has happened very, 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 very fast, uh, very, very rapidly, bringing a lot of challenges there's the issue about population mobility and um, and uh, and uh, and urbanization as well. I mean, we all tend to think, especially in developing countries, migration uh, is the is the main driver. Yes, it's a key driver of urbanization and uh, the, the the whole urbanization process. But natural increase in many African urban sectors still is the main 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 driver of the rapid urbanization that is happening there. Um, uh, the issue about population density and uh, linkages between uh, um, our population itself, the environment, vulnerability to, to effects of climate change, all these issues are linked uh, to, uh, to fertility. But we also know that the issue about how fertility affects well-being, socioeconomic well-being, hasn't been a straightforward issue in, um, in, uh, in academic and development debates. Uh, but it does affect these issues at micro and, uh, and, 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 and both micro and macro levels. And so if you just look at this picture here, of course, we know that birth rates have one of the big, 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 you know, revolutions that has happened in the world. This is just looking from 2070 to 2020. So you are looking at a 50 year period. Uh, birth rates have more or less like gone down by close to half globally. In uh, developed countries, you know, well below refreshment level. In less developed countries, which includes uh, China, there it's about 2.5, close to that global level. But but it's the least developed, the poorest countries in the world, most of whom are in Africa, where the birth rates are still above four. And uh, so when we really look at um, uh, what is happening, it's easy to 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 just look at this as a correlation and say, oh. You know, this is just a correlation. It's not a. It's not a causal effect and that sort of thing. But I mean, that debate is a is a is a different type of debate. I think the issue that I'm focusing on is um, when you look at these figures, when you look at people who really want to dismiss this and say it's just um, a correlation, and um, and uh, and uh, a lot of economists even saying high birth rates or big populations are good for development. What does that mean in terms of uh, how? governments are looking at evidence about fertility or what needs to be done to support families address fertility how is that affecting their thinking um, so in terms of this issue about population growth we know uh, according to the un pro projections and this is the medium term projection showing that uh, africa's population at about 1.3 billion is will, 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 will go up to 2.5 billion. I mean, sorry, I think the, the, the middle year is not 2030, it's 2050. By 2050, it will be 2.5 billion. 2070, it will be actually, sorry, I think I, I don't know how these numbers got messed up there. 2070 is 4.2 billion. So basically what you are seeing here is that, um, and, uh, and a lot of people tend to argue, oh, if you promote family planning or talk about you know issues about reproductive health, you are, you, you are trying to bring a population control agenda. But what I keep t telling people is that this is the medium variant, which, which, which basically already shows that birth rates are going to, to go down almost to, uh, to, to, to 2.6 by 2070, if we have to get those numbers. And we know that this could as well be, uh, um, if it's a half, um, half a child more, the, 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 the sheer size of the population will be much bigger than this, and it will probably be close to, to about five, uh, 5 billion as opposed to 4.2 billion. 
So for me, I like to use this concept of the population momentum when talking about this relationship between birth rates and what that does to population size. So here, these are projections I was doing with colleagues a few years ago, and it's an example of Zambia. You look at the blue chart. So what this chart is saying is that the day when the, the year when the country reaches replacement level fertility, which is 2.1, would determine the how long the it will take for the population to continue growing and stop growing. So you look at the, 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 the blue chart at the bottom there. In uh, Zambia had about 16 million people in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the year about 2015. But we're saying that if 2.1, their birth rate, I was going to decline from about five that point that time to two immediately by 2020. The population will continue growing for another 70, 80 years because of population momentum and only stabilize at around 30 million, around 20, uh, around 21, 15. But if the, the year when that replacement level fertility is delayed, it's reached in 2040, then that population will stabilize at 40, at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at, at 40 million. If it's, uh, it's, it goes on up now, Zambia's population is still above four. So you can see that um, these high numbers that are there are going to be critical. And uh, in a way, you know, we're talking with President Museveni when we presented our demographic dividend work. This is the argument we use to say, because President Museveni was saying, Uganda needs a big population. We need over one, 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 we need over 100 million people. And we did these projections and told him, sir, the 100 million for you, at that point, Uganda had about 40 million, is guaranteed. So it's not, don't think that by, by depriving women of family planning and so on, you're going to stop the population from growing now. The population will grow because there's already this inbuilt population momentum. And um, so the, the slogan we use there to say, we have the numbers in Uganda. Let's focus on investing to get a high quality human capital out of, um, out of those numbers. So, but the, the, the real relationship really between uh, birth rates and, um, and um, um, uh, fertility and well-being has been looking at the issue of GDP. And, uh, and uh, you, you see, this is a, a, a one of those charts where you look at the relationship between uh, total fertility and per capita GDP. You see in the, in the 60s, all the countries, uh, there are some um, African countries, they were all in the corner, high fertility, very, very low per capita GDP. As time has gone, you see that uh, some countries are breaking away, but there are still countries in that corner that still maintained high fertility. And uh, some Asian tigers there who, um, that we know who broke away. But I think the critical thing I want to mention here is that, so this issue about birth rates declining fast and so on is not just an East Asian issue, because as you can see, there's Mauritius there, there's South Africa, there's Botswana, there's uh, Tunisia, there's um, um, uh, uh, Egypt, most of the countries in Northern Africa and Southern Africa that had also, um, uh, had also you know, uh, 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 their birth rates had, 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 had gone down quite fast, but also their GDP per capita um, uh, 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 went up. So when you look at this relationship, the age structure relationship and birth rates, what that uh, translates to it's really depend uh, affecting this dependency ratio. So you look at East Asia, the ratio of working age population it peaked around 2010. It's now on the downward trend. Latin America because birth rates declined much slower than in Asia. It's uh, uh, the peak was going to be at a lower level, but um, uh, but uh, but also much later. But uh, 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 no, this is the Latin America one. Sorry, the red one is Sub-Saharan Africa. Latin America a bit later, but lower because the birth rates took, you know, much longer to uh, to come down there. So it's really through this relationship now that we are seeing more consensus on uh, on uh, especially within Africa with the demographic dividend issue to say that it's actually um, uh, it, it becomes a less contentious issue because we are not talking about only. Uh, uh, lower beds or, you know, promote family planning and there'll be fewer people. You are really talking about the age structure will change and this age structure will provide you with an opportunity to accelerate your economic growth if you make the right investments in it. So these are just charts showing for different countries um, how, you know, the, those that are projected to have higher, uh, uh, more rapid fertility decline are also bound to have a bigger, um, uh, what you might call the labor force surplus, the, the, the proportion of people who be in the working ages 
aspirative to the uh, to the to the dependent children and dependent uh, dads that that's what will give you that opportunity but we we know that it's not just having that you know magnitude of people you have to make the investments in education you have to make investments in health and and reform the economy is really to create enough jobs for the people so the issue really um, uh, this issue we, we are looking you know high child dependency at the beginning um in the end countries where fertility comes down you have that um, um, a labor force barge in the middle Botswana, it, it has its own badge there, not as pronounced because its birth rate didn't go down as much. But the question is, it will, it will translate into an aging problem as well, which a lot of other countries are facing. So when you look at birth rates, and as you will see shortly, as, um, as I'm going forward, um, that um, this, 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 a lot of African leaders, especially politicians, even academics, tend to raise this issue. Why should we be concerned about high birth rates being an issue for development when when actually in the end you are ending up with this aging problem which is also a problem but what i tend to argue to them is that um, you know what i think if you if you have the, the 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 problem with the high child dependency is that it actually limits your capacity to break from your poverty trap because households are just striving to survive many children are being born you don't you you can't educate them enough and so on so this is a lesser of a problem than an aging problem especially if when you had that that labor force surplus you actually used it to accelerate growth uh, development and and a lot of people end their own money and and so the the the, the old age sort, sort of a uh, dependency people can take care of themselves more or because if you really took advantage when you were growing then it means that Basically, with the old age dependency, you, 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 the governments will also be better able maybe to deal with that. Not to say that, you know, there is no government that is um, facing challenges with that, but just to highlight that. Using this national transfer accounts, I just want to illustrate for you, it's a tiny country, um, uh, uh, Botswana, but we've done this work with UNFPA in a number of other countries. This analysis has been done in over 40, Afri uh, not 40, maybe over now, 25 African countries using the national transfer accounts, looking at consumption, looking at labor income. How does that relate to the issues of, um, of birth rates in terms of decomposing how the demographic dividend manifests itself? So what you see here, blue, is the levels of consumption uh, in, in Botswana in 2010. And the, uh, the, yellow, the yellowish color is, uh, is the labor income that people are producing. And what that intersection, between um, there where the, the, the two inter um, are intersect. That's, that's what is the surplus that the labor, the people who are actually working are producing beyond what they are consuming themselves. And so the rest of that brew party there are people who have to be supported by what the workers are producing. But look at the workers are consuming everything they are producing except that small intersection out there. And when you really um, calculate that, you see that what you are seeing, the surplus for Botswana is 2.5 billion pula, which the workers are producing, but there's a deficit of over 24 billion on that side and 2.1 billion on that side. And when you, you, you see that there's about 20, 23 billion deficit that the country is facing every year because you have to feed all these children who are not producing anything. So the question we raised this, I presented this to the president in Botswana was, I mean, Botswana already has birth rates around three, but the question is, are you living beyond your means? Because you, you, you are, people are not really, you know, taking full care of their dependents um, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the country. And also doing further analysis, just to look at what happened in, um, um, uh, in Botswana, decomposing what has been the impact? This is the measuring its demographic dividend. Botswana has per capita income that is very close to a lot of uh, Asian countries. Of course, they have diamonds and other things, but it's also a fact that the, 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 their, their birth rates have gone down. And when you decompose that, you see that um, when you look at the, their window of opportunity to, open the, to end the demographic dividend opened before 1990, and it will close sometime around 2050. And, um, and um, you can attribute about 36% um, uh, of the growth that Botswana has, has had to the way that birth rates 
uh, to the decline in birth rates and the way they have taken care of the demographic dividend. So there's a demographic dividend story in Africa. It is happening in North Africa, in Southern Africa, as birth rates are coming down. We did all these modeling analyses in various countries, showed the potential dividend that countries can earn if they make these investments. And the answer is that this can be very massive. Sorry, I'm not trying to let you look at those numbers. I just wanted to, to show that slide. But I'm going towards the end now, uh, just to say, what has the, so beyond these numbers, looking at the relationship, you know, the African Union, one of the most conservative organizations, because it, it has to sit together with the presidents of Togo, of Mali, of South Africa, of Kenya, they, and, and some governments are still very, very conservative on family planning issues. They, they, they still want to talk about child spacing programs because, because, because it's about spacing beds, not limiting beds and so on. But the African Union in 2017 adopted the roadmap on harnessing the demographic dividend. But what is, what is the interesting thing you see there to know that politics is still a big issue here is that um, they say there are four pillars to this, employment, entrepreneurship, um, uh, education and skills development, health and well-being, rights, governance, and youth and empowerment. In the area discussions we're having, we're highlighting fertility decline, accelerating fertility decline, but they didn't want to highlight it. And you can see also that um, there, the, the roadmap was called harnessing the demographic dividend through investments in youth. So the African Union was saying our demographic dividend is not a fertility decline demographic dividend. It's not a family planning demographic dividend. It's about creating opportunities for our young people. So to the extent that they allow you to enter and start engaging governments, I would say that is fine. But you can see that the politics is still there. We came up with UNFPA with this, what we called an operation, uh, a model, a, a framework for operationalizing. Like if you do these national demographic dividend studies that we ourselves at AFIDEP supported uh, 50, uh, 15 countries over the last four or five years. West Africa, CREFAT, our sister organization has supported also about 15 other countries there. We did these studies and what did they, what resulted into this? A lot of this information went into uh, uh, development, some countries developed a national DD roadmaps to customize the African Union roadmaps. Um, they defined these roadmaps to say, what should we do exactly? Who will be responsible for that and so on. But more critically, over the last three, four years, many countries have integrated the concept of really accelerating fertility decline, changing the age structure to accelerate, accelerate chances of development into their national development plans. So, um, uh, and then the, the, the other part is once you do that, you have also to get this into uh, budgeting processes and your working plan development processes and start implementing and have a monitoring and evaluation tool that will help you do that. We just completed this assessment of uh, what is really happening in the East Africa region where UNFPA has uh, uh, asked us, um, uh, we have an agreement as an implementation partner to support the region on demographic dividend work. So we said, this has been going on since 2012, 2014. What has happened? We see that um, uh, 13 of the 23 countries have actually run uh, government-led demographic dividend studies to look at all these issues and come up with specific recommendations on how to accelerate fertility decline. Nine out of 23 countries have actually developed roadmaps, programs that say, how do we move forward? And um, and then the, the, um, uh, uh, about, about 18 of the 23 countries have, who, that have revised their, their national population policies have now framed the national population policy around the concept of the demographic dividend. Um, and, and, and more critically, 15 of the 23 countries have actually put messages about accelerating fertility decline in their national development five-year, medium-term five-year national development plans, while six have put them in their long-term 20, 30, 40 year national development plans. But I think the other side of this where you are looking at what, how are they coordinating this? How are they engaging with that, all these sectors to make sure that everybody is taking into account issues of uh, promoting fertility decline as, a, as an instrument for accelerating development? That's where the weaknesses are. So uh, what are some of the debates? People are still asking, why should African countries care about reduced fertility when big populations have helped countries like China and India and Brazil become powerful because 
and economically powerful because of big populations, what should be the balance between worrying about high dependency burden and aged populations? What is the ideal birth rate? Are you just saying, let's promote, you know, meet and met need, promote family planning. Where should we stop? I will tell them it's not a question for governments to say where should we stop because you are not manipulating birth rates. You are just making sure those who want to delay their births, who want to stop, have the means to, uh, to do so. And uh, so and, uh, uh, this is now my last slide. What are some of the lessons or key areas where I think that um, um, our help is needed here? It's really a generation of evidence, building local capacity to guide formulation and implementation of specific interventions that can facilitate, accelerate fertility change and enhance socioeconomic investments. And that technical assistance and tools on systems thinking and integrated development planning, how the whole concept of integrating population dynamics and development planning, how do you make it happen in practical terms? I think that's, people talk about it, but how you get it done is still a big issue out there. Issue about results monitoring, how are you going, what indicators are you going to use to, to see that the country is moving in that direction? And also the issue about just how do you generate evidence that resonates with policymakers. After 2017, when the African Union designated the demographic dividend, the top development issue in Africa, every president went to Addis Ababa and talked about this. But I mean, when you really look at what has happened, of course, there's that progress I've talked about, about placing this in these different policies and so on. That has, that has, that, that has been excellent sort of a progress. But at the end of the day, I think the question is, what is it translating to in terms of changing the way government business operates and uh, and uh, under the budgeting and that sort of stuff and so and also how do you now keep the interest it's not a a, a two-year five-year program it's something where the impacts will come in 15 20 30 years time how do you keep polit politicians um, uh, continue getting interested so i'll leave it at that and really just say yeah this relationship between population and uh, fertility and well-being it operates at family level you have too many children, how are you going to take care of them? How are you going to pay for their fees, healthcare? It also affects macro level in terms of uh, uh, providing you know, adequate education. But at the end of the day, um, uh, the point is, um, uh, as governments are, are looking at the evidence, the, this macro level evidence, looking at the demographic dividend, it has been resonating well. I think we're at a point where we should say, how do we support governments keep the momentum to understand this better, but more critically understand what they should do. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation. Ilya, okay, well, now we see you again. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, also again, thank you, Professor Palos. We have already a couple of questions in, uh, and comments in the chat box. So I see maybe the first one to you, Professor Palos, by Sinja Zweifels, uh, who's wondering whether violence at a community level affects data collection and family dynamics in Latin America and how. Maybe um, let's, let's start with you, just a, a quick answer to this one, and we'll take some other questions as we go along. Over to yeah, you. I'm, I'm uh, not an expert in data collection, but I know that in Colombia, historically, they have had problems in collecting data for some of the regions where the conflict and violence is higher. So I guess it's, there is evidence that affects the collection of data uh, in some neighborhoods, some regions where violence is higher. And know that uh, we know now that, that violence in the region is going up. So I guess there's, there's an effect, yes. Thank you very much. We have two questions for Elia, and I, let me put them together because they are basically on the same issue. So Anne Gauthier and Rigi Kashyap are wondering how gender issues might explain differences in fertility levels that you see also between countries you know, and regions, but also uh, between the countries of Africa. How might gender issues explain these fertility differences and the answer to that of course might hint uh, hint at what can be done to help women and men realize desired fertility levels which might be in fact lower than 
the actual levels. Over to you, Elia. Uh, all right, thank you. I think I think that's a, that's a really very very pertinent question. Gender is at the center of the differences, and uh, addressing gender um, uh, disparities is uh, is a central part of addressing the problem. I mean, you can see across Africa that the countries that have high fertility now are countries that also have very, very low education attendance rates for girls. Um, that's 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 without exception. Uh, I think I think we we know that uh, uh, lowering birth rates is not just about providing contraception. There are actually three basic sort of um, uh, 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 pillars of interventions that help to lower birth rates. So. One is, um, uh, I mean, you have, there has to be demand for, uh, for, uh, for, for people to want to have fewer children. And that comes for the most part out of, uh, you know, what is happening to child survival. Children are dying a lot. And, um, and um, I mean, we all talk about this, whether it's the depressment or assurance effect, where parents, you know, um, uh, uh, want to have children who, who survive to old age, whether to support them or whatever. But, but so the, the, the child survival, as, as it's going down, as, 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 as child survival is improving, it starts creating that, 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 that demand for people to say, it's okay to have two or three children. Uh, the other critical issue is just keeping girls in school and giving more opportunities to women. Um, in, many, in many African countries, you look at Malawi, almost half of the girls have become mothers by age 18. Uh, you look at uh, you know many countries in West Africa where birth rates are still very very high. School attendance for girls is very very low, and so if you don't provide those opportunities for girls, uh, economic empower education and economic empowerment of girls and women, it's very very unlikely that the birth rates will will, will, will come down. And um, um, uh, so I think I think I think that's 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 that's, that's just a, a very very central uh, part of it. And there are other gender issues. I mean, issues related to child marriages. How many people are getting married by age fifteen or age eighteen? Kids getting married, and those cultures are still going on. You get married, what are you going to do? They start having children. I mean, issues of even using family planning before you start having children may not arise. So. I think trying to keep girls in school, um, in many countries, there are laws that say you can't marry before age 18, but you know this law is broken, but there's no enforcement. There are no opportunities that are being created. So I think there's a lot that needs to be done around, around gender issues there. And, um, and, uh, and also just recognizing that uh, you can't keep, take African women, I mean, all these guys who are saying we need big populations. I mean, what are you looking at? I challenge them. I talk to MPs and say, do you want just to resolve African women to be baby breeders who bring, who, who, who generate this big population for you when, when actually you are, you, are, you are not looking at their well-being and seeing what impact having those um, uh, 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 higher, higher, higher birth rates have on them because it's very universal. It's the poor. You, we looked at data in Kenya. The richest wealth quintiles, they are getting the number of children they want. The poor are getting two children more than they would like to have. So I think I think all these issues they revolve around gender, and I think I'm talking about the solutions. It's a uh, economic empowerment of women, education of girls, uh, making sure that family planning is universally accessible, making sure that in schools, teenage pregnancy is one of the areas that in Africa. You look at Kenya, you look at um, Malawi, you look at uh, uh, Tanzania. Over the last 20 years, it has hardly changed. And it's very, very high. The other aspects are changing because people are still having all these arguments about, oh, you can't have comprehensive sexuality education. You can't provide contraception to young people. But young people are having sex. In the end, it's the girls who suffer out of this. So I think, I think there, there's a lot we can talk about that. But just to agree with you that gender is quite central. Thank you, Elia. Uh, Professor Palos, we just heard that family formation and childbearing in Africa is relatively, happens at relatively young ages, in Latin America as well. Uh, you showed us some of the data. And, you know, t tell us, what do you think could be some of the explanations for this? I would love to know, is this, is this can we explain this through religious factors? Are these economic circumstances? Enlighten us, please. 
I still don't have the answer because uh, one of the my, my recent papers is precisely asking this question, and then you expect that increases in educational expansion will uh, postpone age at first child and at first union, and it didn't happen. And, and perhaps the reason is that uh, the reasons why in Europe we have postponed is that because we want to have a good job, we want to have a good house, we want to have some sort of stability, and then we wait until we meet these conditions to have children. But probably for uh, Latin America, it doesn't, um, you don't have to wait for that because you will not never get it. And so the uncertainty is so high, informality is so high that they're used to live under these conditions and they, there's nothing to wait for I like that, that. And also, I guess that probably for women becoming mother is a kind of a changing status and um, because they have been able to have children at a very young ages, but they also have been able to control fertility and have only two or no more than two. So there's a sort of a paradox here that I guess explains that the role of families make it possible. It's widely accepted that you have children and then you rely on your families, your standard households to have children there. And then probably they will have to, to save all their life to buy a nice apartment because uh, all the housing is also informal, all the works are, are informal. Uh, it's, it's a different way of, of organizing their lives. Thank you very much. Now we are on top of the hour, but Elia, just in one sentence, I want to ask you one thing. In Africa, we've spoken about the demographic dividend for a while. The AU has a roadmap on realizing the, um, the demographic dividend. Many countries are coming to UNFPA, the agency for which I work, and say, look, we are sold on the concept, help us realize the demographic dividend. My question to you is, does all this conversation about the demographic in div dividend in Africa, has it helped us have an intelligent conversation about demographic shifts? Are countries doing the right thing? Are we talking about it in the right way? Are we on the right track? Just in a very, very briefly, please. All right. So I think I think I'll I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can. I think the the, the 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 concept, as I said, has really helped countries to focus on the issue of our, of our, of our fertility decline without talking about population, which was population increase, which was people were thinking is a Western agenda and that sort of thing. But I think, I think, I think there's a big danger that uh, uh, the, this can die at, at, at rhetoric level, because um, I think a lot of, uh, and you can, you, can, you can probably agree with me that over the last year or two, of course there has been COVID, but even in 2019, the momentum has been waning down a little bit. And I think the countries are stored at that stage where Many of them have even put it in, in, in the national development plans, as I said, but how do you move from there now to, to shifting the investments and, uh, and, uh, and making sure that there are programs? And I think, so we're in the right direction. We can resuscitate, I think, the agenda. It's not completely uh, gone, but there's, I think you need to focus on that. How do we help governments really uh, move from uh, the, those po things they have put in those in those in those policy documents now to engage with um, um, uh, budgeting processes so that now you actually um, uh, uh, translate that into actual money is being allocated because there's not going to be a big bag of money coming from the world bank or whatever for this it's really how do you reallocate the monies that are already there to make sure that you are focusing on things that will change the needle and help the governments move forward. So that's where the technical assistance is needed. And that's where I think UNFPA needs to focus on. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you both. Professor Palos, uh, Dr. Elias Zulu, thank you very much. And I love the birds chirping in the background <laughs> here. I, yeah, I love this. Well, I think. We are concluding the session here. Thank you also to all the participants who contributed to this conversation and back over to the organizers for announcements and details.